Good morning. All right, there we go. Hey, I, I think Haley might have slipped out already, but what a, what a huge deal. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed, but she was, she's probably not working full time. <laughs> probably not. And uh, what, a, what a huge uh, example for us. Amen. Well, we made it through another Christmas season, didn't we? We may not look like much, but we made it, right? Now the diet's starting and all that stuff, right? We traveled, we partied, we hurried and set those Christmas decorations up. How many of you, like, after Thanksgiving, you feel the pressure from your neighbors because there's always that person that's an overachiever, and they're like, after Halloween, they're putting Christmas decorations up. And so we hurried and we threw decorations. I mean, I was up in my tree stringing these lights through this, this little crepe myrtle tree and getting all the, you know, when it's, you know, the little stuff that flakes into your hair, all the seeds from the crepe myrtles. You ever had that? Anyway, anyway so we're hurrying to put up Christmas decorations and then we're hurrying to take them down, right? Because we don't want to be that person either that leaves them up too long. But uh, we're, we're in such a hurry. I, I don't know about you, but I feel like I need a vacation after the holidays. I really do. I'm wore out. I'm white. Uh, the last three weeks have just been go, 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 right? You ever feel like that? You ever feel like you're just going, going, going all the time? Maybe not just the last three weeks, but anybody feel like they're just going, 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 like life never slows down? Anybody feel like that? Just a few of us, right? There's a few responsive people this morning, but yeah, I think we all feel like that. And, um, Maybe because you are going, 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 right? See, going's not a bad thing as long as you're getting somewhere. Where we start to get frustrated, where we start to, to feel the rub is when we feel like we're going, 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 but we're not getting anywhere. Sometimes we get stuck. See, stuck doesn't just happen to cars. Stuck happens to people. It happens to marriages. We get stuck. Stuck happens in relationship. We, we get stuck in relationships. We get stuck in our emotions. We get stuck in our behavior, in our work, in our finances. We experience being stuck in our habits and sometimes even addictions. Now listen, if you feel like you're going, 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 but you're not getting anywhere, then you're stuck. Let's call it what it is. You're stuck. Next week, we, uh, we we're starting a new series. When you came in, you saw that invite card on the chair. It says unstuck. We're going to, over the next four weeks, we're going to discover how to get unstuck. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about it, but, but really, we're going to dive into it heavy. If you know somebody that, you know, they're just stuck, invite them. I believe over the next four weeks, uh, you're going to enjoy the series and you're going to be very helpful, very practical in, uh, in your journey, in your relationship with the Lord. Share the good news with somebody else. You know, churches can get stuck too. It's not just people. Some churches just gather because it's Sunday. Maybe you've been a part of those churches. Maybe, uh, maybe you've seen it. Maybe you've experienced it. I've been a part of those churches before where you just, we're meeting today because it's Sunday, and that's what we do as a church. And sometimes, Sometimes churches can get stuck. Sometimes the focus of a church can be self-centered. It's all about those who are faithfully gathering together each week. And, it, and church and the meeting, the gathering, the, what we call worship or church becomes all about us, all about the group that's those faithful people that meet every week and gather every week. Churches can get stuck. Last year, in January, I shared a message. And uh, it was called The One. How many remember The One? How many still have The One card in your wallet? Anybody? Huh? Everybody's looking. Awesome. Awesome. The One. So I talked about The One I want to read a passage of scripture that I read last year at this same time. We could. It's in Luke chapter 15, verse 4 through 7. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. 
Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now, chances are none of us have ever had to go chase after a sheep, right? Let alone throw one over our shoulders. But the point Jesus is making in Luke chapter 15 is you read through parable after parable or story after story, he's, re- he's, he's trying to, to communicate a message. This is how God views humanity. This is how the Father views us. And the point of Luke chapter 15 is that lost people, lost people matter to God. Lost people are so important to him that he's willing to leave the 99 and go after that one. Lost people really are valuable, and they should be valuable to us. See, that's why we talk about reaching. It's one of our core values on the wall, reaching, because reaching aligns our hearts with God's heart. God loves Lost people, he's concerned about them. They matter to him. It really matters to him that somebody is outside of a relationship with the Father. It really matters to him. It may not matter to us too much because sometimes we get caught up in our, our busyness of life, but it matters to him. Now, saying that someone is lost does not mean that you are and I, you and I are, are better than them. I'm not saying by, by saying that someone's lost, I'm not saying I'm better than them, but I am understanding something, that I am better off. There's a difference of being better than and better off because I've experienced the grace of God that we sang about this morning, that grace that's free. You didn't have to work for it, right? The Bible says very clearly that grace is a gift. It's not by works. It's nothing you can do but it's a gift from God. And we've experienced that. We're better off because of the grace of God. We have been set free, we sang about. And we're better off. So it doesn't mean that we're better than somebody, but we're better off and we've experienced that grace. And and because of that, because we've experienced that grace of God without having to work for it, without having to pay for it, without having to jump through hoops for it, God just poured it on us. We opened our hearts to it, but he gave it to us freely. And because of that, something in us should be motivated. See, you and I, we found our way out of, out of the darkness, out of the addictions, out of the loneliness, out of the pain, out of that hopelessness. And you and I were rescued. That's why we're no longer lost but we are found. Why wouldn't I go back for someone else? If I've experienced so much, something that I couldn't produce on my own, I can't produce enough good works to outdo the bad. You you know, even if you, you know, maybe your worst sin was writing on the walls with crayons when you were three years old, you can't do enough Good to outweigh the bad. I'm sure your sins are bigger than the crayon thing. I'm sure of it. We can never do enough. We cannot generate enough good deeds to outweigh the bad. That's the grace of God. We have been rescued, and why wouldn't we go? Why wouldn't we go after others? Why wouldn't we go back and tell someone else? See, people are lost, but they don't know how to find their way. They don't know how to find their way back to God. When, uh, when Robin and I, on our, we were on our honeymoon, we, uh, we went to North Carolina. We went to several places, but we went to North Carolina, and uh, one of our stops. And, uh, and where we were staying, there was a hiking trail. It's a Joyce Kilmer Forest. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but the Joyce Kilmer Forest is real popular in that area to go hiking and stuff. And so, um, so we went for a hike, and and one of the, there was the normal trail, which was the marked trail, and it was, it, you know, it told you how far it took and all. 
And, uh, and then there was one called the Bare Naked Trail. Well, it was our honeymoon, and uh, you know how you're thinking, at least I was, you know. Uh, still think that way, sorry. But anyway, didn't mean to go there, but I did. Um, so I was like, Bare Naked Trail? I'm like, Heck yeah, let's do the Bare Naked Trail. Um, well, what I didn't realize is the Bare Naked Trail really didn't go anywhere. It just went, 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 and then all of a sudden it was like, stopped. It's amazing. You know, people are trying to find their way to God. And just because there's a trail doesn't mean that it's going somewhere. People try to create their own way, their own trails, their own, their own thing to get them to God. And some are very organized about it. You know, I, I ride dirt bikes, and I've always ridden four-wheelers and dirt bikes and stuff, and I have a, I have a dirt bike. And, and one of the things that bugs me is, is I start out on this trail that looks like a legit trail all the time, going through the woods. I'm like, oh, yeah, new trail. And you get, you get going, and all of a sudden, it's like nothing. Because a hundred other people did the same exact thing, and it got us nowhere. And then you got to try to turn around and, and get out of that situation. And just because there's a trail, it doesn't mean it's going somewhere. And, and we look around us, and we see people that are that are creating these trails, and they look good. They look well-traveled, and, and they're realizing it's not taking me anywhere. Listen, that's not our story. That's not our story. Our story is that we've experienced the grace of God. We've experienced the forgiveness of God. Jesus did everything that needed to be done for us to be in relationship with the Father. The trail, the road that we're on, may not be the most popular in our culture, but it is a real trail. It is the real trail. It is the only trail. There are not many trails that end up at the same place. There's one trail. There's one door. There's one person that every one of us has to go through. That's Jesus. See, people are valuable. They're valuable to Jesus. And that's why they should be valuable to us. That's why they're valuable to me. Because people are valuable to God. Every January, we like to look back at the last year and where we've been as a church. And then we like to talk about, hey, here's where we're going in the future. Kind of, we call it our Vision Sunday. And today, I just want to look back at Vive Church. And uh, I'm I'm excited to be a part of a church that is not stuck. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm not judging anybody else. I'm just saying I'm glad to be a part of of something because I've been stuck before. But just to give you some idea of where we've been in the last year, we had 437 new guests at Vive Church last year. If you're a new guest this morning, amen. That's a lot of people. I don't care how you, how you slice and dice it. That's a lot of people. And on average, because we, we, we kind of monitor a lot of things here at Vibe Church. Because if you, if you monitor things, you can help it to grow. If you ignore it, it doesn't. And so we, we keep track of what's going on. 437 people. On average, there are nine new guests every week. So when you're here at Vive and and you might see somebody that you think you don't know, chances are you don't know them because it's their first Sunday. I spoke with some people this morning. It's their first Sunday. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you decided to come to Vive Church on this freezing cold morning. But 437 people came to Vive for the first time. Most of them came because you invited them. That's the cool, exciting thing about it. 114 people raised their hand last year and said, I want to follow Jesus. 114 people. That's, that's like crazy amazing. I would say this isn't, called, this isn't stuck. You know, I mean, if you, if you meet week after week after week and nobody accepts Christ, I would say you're stuck. I'd say something's going on. 114 people accepted Christ. Some of you are part of those 114 people. 21 people were baptized in water. Amen. And 70 people 
joined Vive Church last year and said, I want this church to be my church. I want to be a part of this. That's awesome. People are valuable to Jesus, and that's why they should be valuable to us. What an exciting thing to be a part of a church that's moving forward. You know, 30 years ago, I said yes to God's calling. 30 years ago, I was in a service, and God began to stir my heart, and my argument to the Lord was, God, I, I don't have what it takes to do what I think you're calling me to do. I, I don't know you that much. I don't know your word. I, don't, I can't do this and that. And I had all these excuses. And I was 17 years old. And I remember it like it was, it was yesterday. And I wondered if I could really make a difference. And I was convinced and I tried to plead my case with God that, that uh, I'm, I'm probably not your best pick, you know? As a matter of fact, I was a little bit clearer. Of, God, I'm not your best pick. There's got to be somebody else. What can one person do? I'm only one person. What power does one person have to make any kinds of change? How can one person make a difference? Well, I found that it only takes one person who is willing to go. Because if you look at Luke chapter 15, and you look at the story of this shepherd who was missing one of his sheep, there's something that's really important in there, is that he didn't just sit back and say, wow, man, I really wish that one sheep didn't leave. Well, I hope he comes back, because he's got a good thing here, you know? You know what he did? He went, right? He went. He left the 99, and he went. See, it only takes one person who's willing to go to make a huge difference. Only one person. That's all it takes. But you have to be willing to go. You have to say, God, I'll go. When I read through the Bible, here's what I see. Because, you know, everybody sees things differently differently. Here's what I see as I read through the Bible. I see God speaking to Abraham in the very beginning and saying, Abraham, I want you to leave Ur of the Chaldeans, of the place where you've grown up, the place you're comfortable with, the place where your father's house is, the place where you are very familiar with everything. I want you to leave Ur, and I want you to go to a place that I'll show you. Genesis chapter 9. He didn't even say clearly, God, you know, Abraham, here's where I want you to go. Here's what's going to happen. Here's your salary. Here's where you're going to live. Here's the kind of car you're going to drive. All those things we care about, right? He just said, I want you to go, and I'll show you. That's what I see. I see God saying to Jacob, go to Egypt. I see God saying to Moses, go back to Egypt. Deliver my people, and then go to the promise that I've given you. I see God say to David, go and defeat the enemies of Israel. I see God say to Solomon, go and build a temple for me. I see God say to Nehemiah, go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls because I'm going to restore my people. I see God the Father say to the Son, go and rescue mankind. And then I think some of the most important words that we we miss when we read through Scripture is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. What did he say? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Let me, let me just help you understand this context of this. This was not reserved only for the pastors. This was to all of those who were following Christ. It was for everyone. And it's for all of us. And so the Great Commission, the, the, 
the last words, some of the last words that Jesus gave to the church, that's us, is go. See, we can get stuck sometimes. Churches can get stuck. People can get stuck. We can get stuck in our relationship with God. We can, we can be comfortable. We can be fearful. We can just play it safe. We can even be selfish. Whatever form it comes in, what happens is we get stuck. But going is an essential part of who we are. Going is not a problem if you're going somewhere, right? I mean, there's nothing worse for me than to spin my wheels and work hard and do everything and then feel like I'm not getting anywhere. Anybody feel me? That's, I mean, that, that's frustrating. That's like, ugh, I'd rather go lay in a hammock somewhere and snore. But, I, you know, going is not a problem. I don't mind being busy. And, and I, I would guess that what frustrates you and why you feel so rubbed many times and why you feel so raw and so frustrated is because you're stuck. Because you're going, 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 but you're not getting anywhere. And sometimes we can get stuck in our relationship with God. See, going is great as long as there is direction and there's purpose. In 2009, eight years ago, God began to stir my heart. It was this time of the year. It was right after Christmas. God began to stir in my heart something that had never been there before. I had been a missionary, living in Austria, was here just to raise support to go back. I was traveling from church to church, sharing my story, you know, asking people, would you support us? Would you pray for us? You know, help send us back. And God began to stir this, this thing inside of my heart that, that had never been there before and, and was a little bit scary. I was, it was, you know, it was foreign. It was, it was different. It was, it was change. See, most of, most of the churches that I had traveled to and, and preached in and, and week after week after week, almost 200 churches I was in in, in the time as a missionary and most of those churches, just being really brutally honest with you, I felt like they were stuck. Now, I don't know for sure if they were, but it was like, man, where's the life? What's going on? You know, and, and then as I went back, came back from Austria and then went back to some of these churches, they were singing the same songs they had sung five years ago, which there's nothing wrong with that, except it was the same group of people that was there five years ago as well minus a few that might have died or gotten mad and left. But it's like, what's going on? And, and so in the midst of that, God stirred in my heart something that, that it was a frustration. And in that moment, in that time in my life, I was stuck. I was stuck as a Christian. As, now, I was a missionary, and people, when I'd come to the churches, they'd be, oh, let's celebrate the missionary. Ooh, there, you know. But I was stuck. I was stuck in my relationship with God. I was frustrated. Nobody knew it, but I did. Listen, sometimes we see a problem and we can even point it out. We're really good at pointing out things and seeing problems. But if you see a problem, here's what I learned. If you see a problem and you can point it out, whether it's most, I'm talking mainly about the church. Maybe you're sitting here and you say, hey, I, I can see this problem with Vive, and I can see this problem, and I can see, and I can point it out. Listen, if God is showing you that, then he's probably speaking to you and saying, go. I'm not, I'm not talking about leaving. I clarify that. Go, get out of here. No. Let's bring clarification. He's saying, do something about it. You know, do something. If you see there's a problem, man, people aren't connecting in relationships, then hello, do something about it, right? You can point it out, do something. About it. Man, people don't give around here. Hello, you know, I mean, people need to be, you know, reached with the gospel. Guess what? If you can see it and you can point it out, God's saying go. 
And see, that's what happened for me. I could see the problem, and I was frustrated. And I, uh, uh, I wouldn't go to this church if I was in this town. Uh, uh. And then all of a sudden, God said, I'm, I want you to go. Huh? I want you to go. I want you to start a church. I want you to go, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what it's going to look like. I'm going to show you what it's going to be. I felt like Abraham. Like, can I have it all up front? Can you give me, like, g- give me the manual? Can I, where's the website? Nothing. And so in 2009, my family and I moved into villages at Lakeshore. God called us to Columbia to start a church. See, I was stuck. I could see the problem. I could point it out. And God said, go. Do something about it. I see a problem. I see a problem in South Carolina, specifically Columbia. I don't know how you are when you drive around, but here's what I see. I drive around Columbia, and I see, I see churches in empty buildings. I see a church down at the old food line. I don't know if anybody sees that. Probably just me, okay? I see a church in that building down there. When I drive around Columbia and I see an empty building, I'm like, oh, church, great place for church. Oh, church ought to be there. When I see an empty piece of land, I see churches. I see a problem. I see a problem, and I can point it out. Guess what that means? God's saying go. See, South Carolina doesn't need another church. If you came from the north, you might be saying, man, this place is like overpopulated with churches, right? They're everywhere. South Carolina doesn't need another church, but South Carolina needs a church that will bring people to life. That's not a better than statement. But let's be real, let's be honest. South Carolina needs churches that will bring people to life. When we started Vive Church, I know, I know all the churches around said, really, really, do we need another church? I think of a lot of people that are sitting here this morning that wouldn't be here this morning if if Vive Church wasn't here. I mean, people have been brought to life. So yeah, we need churches that will bring people to life. I knew that when we started this church, that it was more than just starting a church. I remember back in 2009, summer of of 2010, specifically, just before we launched the church, God stirred something in my heart that was, it, he, he started to give me a little glimpse of this is bigger than just what you're doing here. And, I, and, and that was the only way I, I could articulate it. And I shared it with a few people. You know, you remember when, when the Spirit of God spoke to Mary? Remember the Christmas story? And, and it says she pondered all these things in her heart because it was too big, it was too scary to share. Well, that's how I felt. I was like, I don't know what that means. And I, if I say it, it might come across as, as like, who do you think you are? And I still feel a little bit like that when I say it. But, I, but, I, but the, the Holy Spirit started to stir that in me. And, and I knew that this was more than just about one church and in one place. But I felt, that, I felt like there was a movement in my spirit, if you can understand that. There was a movement. And sometimes along the way, though, we have setbacks. See, God's put things inside of your heart. He has called you to go, and maybe, maybe you've made those steps. You started to, to make movement in that direction. And then you experience setbacks. Two years ago, we launched a church in Orangeburg and then had to close it. 
it was for me the most painful thing. Every time I go through things, I think that's the most painful thing. And it's like, God, can we please stop with that one? I want to use that example for the rest of my life. But I have a feeling there's going to be more painful things because there's so much growth. There's so much life that comes out of that pain, isn't there? And so we went through, I went through a very tough time as a pastor. And man, I, I, I was, I'm a positive person anyway. You know, I'm not, I'm not a negative person. But I was positive, and I, I would say, you know, we're going to plant a, again. God's called us to plant churches, but in the back of my head, I'm saying, no way. No way. But, my, you know, you know the, the Spirit's saying yes, and the flesh is saying no, and there was a struggle that was going on. And, and over time, God began to restore some things in me. And last uh, April, I think it was, I was sharing with Pastor Chuck, uh, in the office, and, and I said, I think we're ready to get pregnant again. And he's like, oh, that sounds weird. Don't say that. Don't say that. It still sounds weird. I, I just say it just to make him feel weird. But I felt like, I felt like I'm ready to get pregnant again. I felt like something died. And now there was this hope and this life again. And, and so that was in April, and you know, sometimes setbacks can be a prison of fear for us. No matter what you've gone through, those setbacks can, can real quickly, if you allow them, become a prison of fear. That I don't ever want to feel that way again, right? I don't ever want to get married again because I don't ever want to feel that way. I don't ever want to have another child because I don't want to experience the pain of losing one. And We go through these things that can become prisons for us. This is so important. If you want to discover new land, then you must lose sight of the shore. If you want to discover new land, you've got to lose sight of the shore. And don't allow those setbacks to keep you in prison. So in May, April, I'm, man, we're ready to, we're going to plant another church. We're going to do this. In May, Got a call from my mother-in-law. I'm at the hospital or the doctor's office. They're sending me to the hospital. They're saying I've got a brain tumor. We hopped in the car and we were beeline down to Florida and she had emergency surgery, had a tumor the size of my fist removed from her brain. It's a glioblastoma cancer, which is the worst form of cancer you can have. Doctors don't, you know, they don't talk curable with glioblastoma. They don't they don't give you a whole lot of hope. That's just sometimes what doctors do, you know. But our hope doesn't come from them. And so we made plans and we, we worked some things out. And, and my father-in-law and mother-in-law moved to South Carolina. They sold their home in Florida. And they moved in with us. So they've been living with us since then been a great experience really has I'm glad we had a great relationship beforehand because it could have been bad I love my mother-in-law and father-in-law in the midst of all that we started planning okay where are we gonna where are we gonna live because we got to figure something out right because I'm sharing a bathroom with my uh which was then both kids but now one's married and now I'm sharing a bathroom with my 18 year old daughter and, and she's just nasty I'm just gonna tell you so I'm like, I don't want to do it. So uh, she's at home watching online probably, screaming. Um, she's sick this morning. But anyway, so, uh, so we're looking for a place to live, and we're driving around. We're driving all over, seems like South Carolina, uh, Columbia and Ridgeway and, and Chapin and Lexington. And, and just, you know, we drove and drove and looked at every place and, and all of that stuff, and and something kept drawing my father-in-law back to the Chapin area. He really wanted to live on the lake. And I'm like, I would never be able to afford to live on the lake. So I'm like, I can make the drive. I want you to enjoy your life. I want to help you. you. You guys have been such a blessing to us. I'll make the drive. I don't care. In one of our trips to Chapin, one of our times there, God spoke to me and said, I want you to plant a church in Chapin. 
I said, cool, yeah, we, I, we, you know, I think we've got some people at the church we can, and God said, no, I want you and Robin to plant a church in Chapin. I'm like, oh. See, when you see a problem and you're able to point it out, God will say, go. So be careful. <laughs> be careful. And so the vision, what I want to share with you, the exciting thing is that we're ready to get pregnant. We're ready to start another church. God has called Robin and I, I'm certain of it, to plant another church. It'll be a Vive church. It'll be a Vive campus. I'll continue to be the lead pastor at Vive. Chuck and Maggie have done a great job. We have been working on this transition Looking back, it's like, wow, the Holy Spirit has just led this whole thing. But we will start a church in Chapin. I want to give you a, a, some, some uh, information. How is this transition going to look like? Well, like I said, Robin and I continue to be the lead pastors at Vive Church. Um. We want to launch the campus with a campus pastor because I believe after two years, we're going to release that campus. There's something God's put inside of me, and um, there's an apostolic calling that, that, that I've been aware of for years, but in, in our context, sometimes I, I'm careful to say it because I don't want people saying, I don't, want, I don't want the title, but there's a calling that... There's something inside of me, I can't shake it, and instead of fighting it, I'm just, you know, I'm going to roll with it, and that's to plant churches, and so we're going to launch with a campus pastor and a staff. You're not going to get, you're not going to, like, uh, not see me. I'm here. I'm, I'm still over this thing. We're not leaving Vive. We're going to Chapin. See, Vive isn't my church. Vive is a vision that God conceived inside of my heart nine years ago, eight years ago. And it spread into your hearts. We are Vive Church. And God's called us to go. Not just me. He's called us to go as a church. I mean, to me, I think that's exciting to be able to be a part of something that is is not stuck, something that's moving, something that's making a difference, something that's bringing people to life. What an exciting thing. I'll be honest with you. If I, if I said to you, um, man, I'm, I'm not fearful at all. There's no fear. You know, I'd be lying to you, all right? Fear is nipping at my butt. Some of you are like, oh, well, you shouldn't have fear. Well, listen. Listen. Do you think the enemy wants this? He's throwing everything at us. Yeah. Fear is nipping at my butt, but guess what? I'm not giving in to it, obviously, or I wouldn't be telling you this this morning. When, you, when God calls you to do something, when he calls you to go, whatever it is, whatever, whatever you see needs to be done, when he calls you to go, I'll guarantee you fear is going to be biting at you. It's going to try to hold you back. And you'll have a choice. You can give in to it or you can keep moving forward. So we're not giving in to fear. We're moving forward. We're excited about it. Now here's, here's where we get to be a part of this as a church. Because this is not a one-man show. This is not something that God has just called me to, but he's called our church to. It's called Vive Church to do this. And here's what I need you to do. When, when the ushers came forward earlier, they gave out an envelope. I'm not expecting you to give right now, but I would like you to do this. First of all, everyone that's here this morning can pray. And I want to ask you, because it's a spiritual battle, I want you to pray with us. Over the next year, we're going to launch the church next January, 2018. 
over this year, I'm working on forming four teams. One is a prayer team. I need people to pray. Pray, because this is a spiritual battle. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But the gates of hell will fight against it. So pray. Pray for us. Every one of you, I'm I'm asking, everyone can pray. Most of you can give. I mean, we saw a perfect example of that this morning. Haley, fifth grade, $1,000 to BGMC. Most of us can give. And here's what I'm asking you to do. I just want to be really bold about it. Is I want to ask you, I'm looking for 50 people who will say, in the next year, I will give $1,000 to plant the church in Chapin. The $50,000 does not go to me. It's not my salary. I'm actually a missionary. I'm supported by churches and pastors all over the U.S., and there's a lot of freedom that I can, I can have because of that. This is going to help provide for a campus pastor, for some staff, for equipment, for things that we need. But I'm asking 50 people to give $1,000. And maybe you're like, hey, I could do more than that. Awesome. Love for you to. Don't be limited. So all of you can pray. All of us can pray. Most of us can give. And I'm leading the way. I already got my mind filled out. Robin and I are giving $1,000 to the, to, the, to the planting of this new church. We're making that investment. So I'm asking in those four teams, I'm looking for a prayer team, a giving team, a launch team, and a leadership team. So most of you can give, all of you can pray, and some of you can go. You might be living in the area over there. You might say, hey, that's close. And you can be a part of that. That's what we're looking for. But this morning, if you have that envelope, if you don't mind taking it, if you don't have it with, like if you didn't get one in the pocket in the chair in front of you, would you take that? I'm not asking you to give right now, but what I am asking for as I put together this giving team, because we're not going to do it alone, is for you to say, hey, you can count on us. You can count on me. On the front cover is information, it's your name, email address, all that stuff. If you could fill that out. And then on the inside, you lift up the lid of the, the envelope. It says reoccurring giving. It says amount. And how often? If you say this, I'll give this amount monthly or this amount weekly. If you want to fill out the information, you can. To give through a checking account or through a credit card. But here's what I want. After the worship, when the service is all over, our ushers are going to stand at the back doors and they're going to collect these. And I'm asking you to partner with us. We can't do it. We can't do it without your partnership. We can't do it without your prayers, without your giving, and without some of you going. And so that's what we're asking for. God's called us to go. There it is. Would you stand with me? Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you, God, for for what you've done in our lives. Amazing things. We ask your blessing. We ask, Lord, that you'll give us a clarity as we hear you to speak to us as we go. You're calling some to begin leading small groups you're calling some to begin leading outreaches and God you're calling some maybe even into ministry you're stirring hearts right now I thank you for that Jesus name